While the Pacific Highway at Raymond Terrace has been the scene of attacks on vehicles on a number of occasions in recent years, police are shocked at the severity of this latest attack. It is concerning when we have uh, a number of persons that uh, did receive some injuries. Uh, one truck driver in particular uh, reported into the police that uh, he was uh, suffering from irritation in his eye. Police allege the culprits aged 12, 14 and 16 had been drinking when they decided to throw large rocks at passing traffic just before 9 on Sunday night. Windscreens were shattered and in one case a baby asleep in the back of a BMW was almost hit. Police say the three boys were concealed here just north of the Raymond Terrace overpass. Their attack lasted around 30 minutes, damaged a dozen vehicles and put at least as many lives at risk. I really don't believe that any of them fully contemplate the, uh, the seriousness of, of what could actually happen. Uh, we've seen in the past that unfortunately some of those incidents have resulted in death. They will now be dealt with under the Young Offenders Act. Police say while the highway is regularly patrolled, there's little they can do to prevent these sorts of attacks. It is very hard because it is periodic. Uh, that's the reality. Madeline Bond, NBN News. NIB put months of spade work into finding a new site. Now that it has, the process of shifting ground has really begun, with excavation work on the honeysuckle block starting this week. We simply outgrew our existing premises. Uh, the company's doubled its size in the last eight years and we needed uh, more room to accommodate our staff. The building itself, we're told, will look like the neighbouring Price Waterhouse Cooper's office block. And by the time NIB staff move into their new headquarters in August next year, the medical insurer could be on the stock exchange. We see in other parts of the world, once a major listed company moves into an area, uh, often others follow. Across the tracks on the corner of King and Union Streets, a service department complex is earmarked for the West End, with plans now on display at Council. It's 12 storeys high and within city guidelines, a block from where a 26-storey development was proposed in Hunter Street and later withdrawn. You can well imagine, particularly when you look at Latex House, at a height of around 12 storeys is something people can accept more easily. And to make sure that Civic, Wickham and Hamilton stations are on a level playing field, platform extension work has started to accommodate the eight-car Sydney-Newcastle trains. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. Thirty thousand people are diagnosed with some form of cancer each year in New South Wales alone, and sadly many won't survive. Cancer claimed Sandra Rufo's life two years ago at the age of 39, leaving her husband Andrea and two daughters Jessica and Jordana to come to terms with the loss of their mum. It's a real roller coaster ride, um, and especially when you have young children um, growing growing up with that. Um, when the, when the final diagnosis came with, with her with the multiple brain tumours, yeah, it was devastating. The Newcastle family struggled to answer many questions after Sandra's diagnosis and became the driving force behind this new publication all about living with advanced cancer. So it will help guide them through their emotional reactions, the emotional reactions of their family, how to cope with the day-to-day, -day, what treatment options do they have. It gives a lot of information that people don't have to go and question themselves about it, they can just turn to the book. The booklet is available from the Cancer Council. Paul Lobb, NBN News.
Tiring of tinkering with his lineup in an effort to rectify poor starts to games, the coach is putting players on notice. Get moving soon, or he'll do some of his own. I'm not putting any timeline on that, but you know, it's it's uh, we're coming up for six weeks, which is a quarter of the season, so you know, we're getting close. If they need any firing up, the coach hinted that acquiring fresh talent this season is a possibility, given the newfound salary cap relief after Andrew John's retirement. Just had some uh, discreet inquiries or availabilities been, uh, been made to us. In an added touch to the former captain's farewell, the number seven jumper will be retired for Sunday's match in honour of Andrew John's. Jared Mullen to suit up in number 18. Regan Tanner is on standby for Kangaroo Steve Simpson for a Broncos game that should bring out the best in everyone. Brisbane always aim up and uh, I think we've got to treat them with the respect they deserve so it, it'll be a big one either way. Not so for Milton Thiday. His season over before it really got going with scans revealing he requires a full shoulder reconstruction. Yeah, yeah, just, you know, really devastated in, in, in the outcome. Making things even harder, the dynamic outside back is off contract and doesn't know where he stands on a new deal, only that he doesn't want to leave. I'm starting to love this place and, and I'm feeling more comfortable with, with all the people here uh, in footy and outside of footy. The 2003 Sydney to Hobart Line Honours winner looked a little like a big fish in a small pond as she raised her sails on Newcastle Harbour today. At 30 metres long and with a mast towering 41 metres into the air, the Super Maxi dodged the harbour traffic before heading out to sea where she's more at home. It's a little bit small, a little bit smaller than Sydney Harbour. We're used to uh, blasting around that or on Moreton Bay or um, down in, uh, in Melbourne as well. So. A uh, little, bit, little bit used to uh, open water, but you get that here. Today's sail gave the crew a chance to check the boat's systems and entertain some Novocastrians before returning to Melbourne. Scandia's 2004 dream of back-to-back -back Sydney Hobart wins was dashed when her crew was forced to abandon ship off the northeastern tip of Tasmania. Since then, the boat has finished third twice. But all going well, owner Grant Warrington and his crew will have a successful race south this year. We're uh, planning to pull a boat out of the water in a couple of weeks and uh, do quite a few modifications to the boat and get it ready for next year's Hobart and um, hopefully have another win with the boat. It's, uh, it's had one and I'm sure there's another one in it. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Milton Orkopoulos was released on conditional bail last November, but when a third alleged victim made allegations, fresh charges followed, resulting in the former MP's arrest on Monday. In making a new application for bail, Barrister Mark Buscombe told Newcastle Local Court, with respect to Mr Orkopoulos' prior bail conditions, there's not one hint or suggestion that he has not complied, and that the former Swansea MP is a person of good character. In refusing bail, Magistrate Richard Wakeley said since a third alleged victim came forward, the Crown's case had strengthened. Magistrate Wakeley also said the alleged facts infer a propensity to a type of sexual behaviour and that there has been an alleged disregard for the interests of the young person. Appearing via video link, the former MP was visibly upset when told, for now at least, he'll have to remain in custody. However, Magistrate Wakeley did leave open the prospect of another bail application if a responsible person was to remain with Mr Orkopoulos at all times during his release. The former MP now faces 54 child sex and drug offences allegedly committed with three individual boys between 1995 and last year. The matter returns to court on the 9th of May. Adam McKilrick, NBN News.
When the state government recently upgraded the Pacific Highway intersection with the Mile Way without a flyover, people who used the busy turn-off were angry, claiming that it's only a matter of time until someone is killed in a serious crash. So today's federal announcement during Patterson MP Bob Baldwin's electorate afternoon tea was welcomed. The government will contribute $10 million towards the construction of what they call a grade separated or flyover in common language interchange. <laughs> the money depends on the state matching dollar for dollar. Earlier, the Prime Minister was greeted by anti-war protesters as he arrived at the Williamtown RAF base. He was there to meet local personnel about to be deployed to Afghanistan. We're sending 75 uh, people and they're taking over a major radar operation from the Americans. Among them, Flight Sergeant Peter Ferguson from Adamstown. Excellent opportunity to uh, put all the training that we've had and our day-to-day -day ops that we do here into practice in another sort of uh, theatre. On other local issues, the PM hinted that further money would be made available to repair Newcastle's ailing Fort Scratchley and that road funding was more important than a new footy stadium. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Newcastle City Councillors have voted to apply for a 9.9% rate increase to generate an extra $10 million to be spent on maintaining the city's infrastructure. There will be more money going to infrastructure than ever before if this budget is adopted in the way it's drafted. And it will require nine additional staff to organise the maintenance projects. We're doubling our delivery in roads and drains and we need more staff to be able to ensure we put those services on the ground. Under next financial year's proposed budget, Council plans to cut $1.5 million from general spending, $2.5 million from lower priority services and 20 jobs, while $1.4 million will be spent on caring for natural assets like trees and waterways. In addition to the rate hike, homeowners will pay $25 in stormwater charges. The Lord Mayor says that tax increases should be a once-in-a-decade impost. I think if this, if this variation is granted, it will be what I expect will be for a 10-year period. Madeline Bond, NBN News. While police say there's been less late-night violence on the streets in the Newcastle CBD over the past few weekends, following an increased police presence, they still want a 1am lockout introduced at pubs and clubs. Well, I think at the moment... Um it's an option that should be considered uh, in the basis that it will give the police the opportunity to deal with people that are outside the premises after those that 1am curfew. However, unless licensed premises voluntarily introduce lockouts, only the state government has the power to enforce them. Newcastle City Council says it has virtually no control over existing pubs and clubs operating hours. If an operator, a licensee, has a, um, uh, an approved operating time of, say, 4am, the council can't take that back from them. It would become a court matter. Things were upbeat at the Jagers launch, even though in the back of people's minds they knew this was the beginning of the end. Each time you play a team, it's the last time you'll play the Kestrels at home or the last time you play the Firebirds in Queensland. So each of those games is going to have a little bit more meaning. There's currently a joint venture on the table between the Jagers and the Swifts to play in a new Trans-Tasman League. Netball New South Wales is particularly concerned because of the drop in uh, numbers that we'll actually have at that elite level. At the junior level though, there's no shortage and for this last National League season, each Jager has been assigned a Hunter Association. As for the team's preparation, it's been a varied pre-season which included a boot camp style training session in Singleton with nine new players in the squad of 14. How we'll go, I, we've got us no idea but it's been really exciting working with them and watching them develop over the last three months. On a perfect day for a roll-up, it was only fitting a huge crowd gathered to farewell a man who gave more than 30 years to the sport. 
Starting as a club secretary in 1974, Les Parrott went on to amass an amazing list of achievements during his time as an administrator. His influence, his energies and his strengths, and he really sort of got people moving and of course bowls was his life. With his coffin draped in flowers from his own garden as well as some treasured possessions, his daughter spoke of a man who always stood by his convictions. As a lasting tribute, friends and family honoured Les with one final role. He is an icon and there's no two ways about that and I'm sure that uh, after today's uh, ceremony he will be remembered for many, many years to come. Les Parrott was 82. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. It was one of the deadliest disasters in modern history and when the documentary The Third Wave premieres in New York on April 29, filmgoers will be confronted by the reality of the 2004 tsunami. It's raw, it's real, it's, there's no scripts, there's no, you know, this is really how it was over there for us. Watching the disaster unfold on television, Don Patterson was compelled to fly to Sri Lanka and start his own aid mission. The former army engineer never expected to feature in a film at one of the world's most prestigious festivals that could eventually be seen by millions. Donny shared the locals' pain during his six months in the devastated region, losing more than 12 kilograms on his first visit. He's hoping the documentary will inspire others in the future. Family supported me and I'm, I'm really grateful that I was actually in a position to be able to just Say, hey, I want to get on an aeroplane and go over there and do something. Mr Patterson flies to the US tomorrow to promote the film. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Witnesses say the victim seen here was lucky to escape with a fairly minor wound after being stabbed with a knife by a customer outside the Woolworths in Maitland Road. Police say the security guard had asked his alleged assailant to leave the store for swearing and inappropriate behaviour at around 10.40 this morning. A security guard walked him out the front at which time he uh, produced a knife and um, uh, as a result of an altercation, the security guard received a minor laceration. Witnesses say the security guard stepped back as the customer tried to stab him and managed to avoid a potentially more serious injury. The victim's wife was clearly distraught as she watched ambulance officers treat her husband. A 37-year-old Shortland man has been charged with malicious wounding over the alleged attack and will appear before Newcastle local court tomorrow. Madeline Bond, NBN News. Police say they won't be basing their operations or strategies on the latest figures released by the Bureau of Crime Statistics. The figures follow crime trends between January 2005 and December 2006 and don't take into account any of the alcohol-related crime and violence experienced in Newcastle's CBD so far this year. It certainly doesn't uh, meet with what we've seen in the last uh, probably um, say three to four months where we've seen some quite horrific crimes being committed. Despite the figures showing no increase in alcohol related crimes including assault, police say they'll maintain a strong late night presence in the CBD. Resident action groups also believe the Bureau's figures are misleading. We simply don't believe that. Ask any frontline police officer, any ambulance officer, Ask the people in the casualty services at the John Hunter and the Martyr Hospital and they all tell you that violence, 
driven by alcohol, is on the rise. Newcastle City Council is this evening discussing the need for a 1am lockdown of the CBD's licensed venues. Just last month, Rhodes Minister Eric Rusendahl told NBN News that there were no plans for a flyover at the Pacific Highway intersection with the Mile Way in the short term. As it stands now, the independent advice clearly says for at least the next 10 years it's an adequate intersection to provide important safety to everybody that utilises it. But according to Great Lakes councillor and local resident Len Roberts, the state has given assurances it'll fund half the project. Well, when we had a deputation to Mr Costa when he was the then Roads Minister, he said if the Feds come to the party, it'll get done. Well, the Feds have come to the party and it's now up to the state government to do their bit. Locals have campaigned long and hard for a flyover, which they say will reduce the risk of serious crashes. New State Liberal member for Port Stephens, Craig Bowman, was on hand to hear the Prime Minister's funding promise yesterday. He says he'll lobby the State Roads Minister when Parliament resumes next month. But he may have a battle on his hands. A statement from Eric Rusendahl's office today was non-committal, saying that the State Government will look at the proposal in the context of the entire Pacific Highway upgrade. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Roadside mailbox or RMB numbers are supposed to be a thing of the past. The Department of Lands wants all councils to ensure rural addresses go under the new numbering system. A number is allocated to a property based on how far away from the start of the road it is. It's, it's great because you get to the start of the road you're on and technically you click your trip metre on your, on your speedo and you should be able to tell exactly where you're going in terms of the house you're looking for. Darren Bresgrove has changed to the new numbering system and also happens to be a rural fire service volunteer. He says the current changeover situation is a mess. There are three lots of people contributing to the mix of confusion. There are those that simply haven't changed their property number, those that have, and then there are those that display both, with the old one crossed out. You could have your right number and you could give that to an emergency services call and they still couldn't find you because of the other numbers would be, that haven't changed would still be confusing them. Yep. So everyone's at risk still. Sarah Elmselli, NBN News. By their own admission, it hasn't been the strongest start to the season for the Knights forwards, but there's little doubt they're sick of the criticism. We don't listen to any of that crap really that you blokes have been going on about, I suppose. And um, yeah, we're just going to do our own game and keep going. Josh Perry and Clint Newton will lead from the front of the Newcastle pack on Sunday against the Broncos. Despite the defending Premier's poor start to the season, the Knights forwards are still focused on stopping Brisbane's attack. You build your whole game around defence, so I think that if we can start strong and, and defend well as a, as a unit, not as individuals, then I think we could, it'll go a long way to sort of getting away to a good start. 20-year-old Corey Patterson makes his debut in the starting 13, packing down in the second row. A small fracture in his little finger isn't expected to stop Danny Badiris from playing, but the squad will have to contend with the fanfare surrounding the Andrew Johns tribute. Yeah, we spoke about this morning. We're trying to sort of keep that, you know, apart from the game and we just want to go out there and do it for ourselves more than anything. Meanwhile, hooker Terence Cucu will start in Premier League this weekend as he returns from suspension and injury. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News.
Daniel Aman never thought he'd be an example for others to follow, but what a difference boxing has made. All right, when you throw it, don't drop it first. Throw it from your chin, bring it back to your chin, all right? At ease giving instructions, the Stockton Southpaw's an unlikely teacher. I just didn't really have much to do with myself since I got kicked out of high school, had a hard time getting a job and um, just wasted me days doing nothing most of the time until I walked in the gym and started boxing. Straight away he showed a bit of determination, which I liked, and then he's just now the Australian cruiserweight champion going for his third defence in a few weeks' time. He's rated number 12 in the Commonwealth. Everyone wanted their crack at the national champion. Above the belt, that's, that's low. Hitting him everywhere but the soles of his feet. And at this Youth Week celebration, finding your feet was all part of the fun. It's been put on by the Samaritans, a place where even the grown-ups can be kids and the kids that little bit more grown up. Nevertheless, the magic was certainly there. Adam McIlrick, NBN News. Hundreds of angry residents and business owners filled the Newcastle City Council chambers last night, demanding action be taken to stop the violence, antisocial behaviour and alcohol-related crime being experienced in the city's centre every weekend. Newcastle's Street Outreach Service Coordinator Darren Welsh has seen it all and says after 2am the city almost becomes a no-go zone. Very unsafe. There's numerous assaults, um, you see people urinating on doorsteps every hundred yards or so up and down Hunter Street, people falling over drunk, vomiting, it's, uh, it's not a nice place to be. Most people at the public voice session were in favour of introducing a 1am lockdown and earlier closing times for licensed premises like pubs and clubs. That'll stop the movement of people around town which will stop a lot of the mindless violence and, and vandalism on the streets. But the Lord Mayor says a curfew alone won't fix the problem. Whilst we understand the frustration on many the, from many of the inner city residents, this can only be worked out around a table with additional resources from the state. That includes more police on the street and improved overnight transport to get people out of the city and away from trouble. Madeline Bond, NBN News. It was an extensive vandalism attack. Every single window across the back of the former West Walls End Bowling Club smashed and every room ransacked. The repair bill has run into the thousands of dollars. Fed up with the empty building being a target for vandals, Lake Macquarie City Council has now employed security guards to monitor it around the clock. We've just repaired the building uh, back to with all the windows replaced and we'll keep um, security guards there um, for, the, for the interim period. Catholic organisation Mercy Care has submitted a proposal to Council to use the building to run a welfare service for the elderly and disadvantaged. Council says it believes the vandalism attacks will end once the building is occupied. They're just currently working on some plans for the redevelopment of the site and we expect them to be lodged with Council soon. Following the approval of those plans, uh, the Mercy Care will be able to get in there and start uh, redeveloping the building to suit their requirements. Christy Carter, NBN News. Steamfest gathered momentum with a noisy start as the vehicles that haven't been around for a century took to the streets. 
But as impressive as these steam-powered trucks, tractors and road locomotives may be, in the eyes of true steam fans, they don't hold a candle to this rusty piece of equipment, the star of this year's event. It's the only existing fragment left of Australia's first traction engine, the Megathon. Today, its very first journey from Morpeth to the New England Highway 150 years ago was recreated. Meanwhile, it was all aboard on the kids' party train, where hundreds of youngsters got to experience travelling on a train similar to Harry Potter's Hogwarts Express. When the Hunter Pirates franchise folded, Ben Melmoth headed to Singapore for a one-year contract with the Slingers. Now the former King and Falcon is back down under on a two-year deal with the Gold Coast Blaze, and he couldn't be happier. Yeah, happy to be back. Um, it's, uh, the experience in Singapore was great. Uh, it was only going to be for one year, and uh, so uh, no, we're very excited about going to Gold Coast. They've been up there a couple of times for holidays, that sort of thing, and um, I think it's a very exciting uh, place to be, uh, to be playing, especially with the Titans, the new football team signed up as well, of course. At a shade over two metres tall, Melmoth is one of several big men already hired by the new franchise. It's the sixth club he'll have played for in his 13-year professional career and will join the Blaze along with a former teammate in Scott McGregor. I'm starting to play with, uh, with Scotty again. Uh, I remember the last time we played was in Sydney and in, uh, with the Falcons my first year, of course. So, uh, you know, it's going to be good to see a familiar face and uh, hopefully the, the Newcastle uh, influence will, be, uh, will, will do us well and, uh, and uh, you know, we'll kick some butt our first year. Paul Lobb, NBN News. With memories of last year's trophy win still fresh in their minds, the North Stars will travel to the ACT for their opening match against Canberra tomorrow night before bussing it home to the Hunter Ice Skating Stadium for a clash with Western Sydney on Sunday. The North Stars have signed imports from Canada and Sweden this season who will play alongside a healthy troop of locals in a bid to make it a hat-trick of National League wins. In the Newcastle Rugby League, it's round five this weekend and the Butcher Boys will take on Raymond Terrace at St John Oval tonight. Curry and Cessnock are at home tomorrow, while Lakes and the Bay will host Macquarie and Wests on Sunday. This week sees round one of Series 2 in the local rugby. Hamilton will take on University, Merriweather Carlton will face Singleton and the Tars will meet the Wanderers. And it's round two of the NBN State Soccer League, with Edgeworth taking on the South Cardiff Gunners tonight at Jack McLaughlin Oval. Tomorrow, Weston will meet Hamilton Olympic, while Sunday will see Rosebuds, the Roosters and the Stags all playing at home. Brothers Andrew and Steve Searle flipped their boat at 150 kilometres an hour in last year's round of the offshore series in Newcastle. $100,000 in repairs later, the boat is back in the city ahead of Sunday's race and they're hoping there'll be no repeat this weekend. No, and uh, you say that when you go out there, but it could it could happen again this year. You don't know. I mean, uh, obviously you don't plan to do it, but um, you've always got to be aware of it. Round three of the National Series will see 16 boats compete in a course both inside and outside Newcastle Harbour. It's a bumpy old ride in the cabin of one of these muscle boats, which are capable of speeds of over 200 kilometres an hour. At 52 feet long, the Searle Brothers' boat is the longest in Australia and the skipper says they've fixed the flipping problem. 
This boat was an experimental boat a few years ago and uh, it, um, it has a lot of lift so it tends to want to blow over and um, so the modifications this year they've uh, brought the back up and brought the nose down and uh, it's a rocket ship. Practice starts from 3.30 tomorrow afternoon with racing on Sunday from midday. It's the fourth time in three weeks the staff at Walls End Subway Outlet have been left to clean up after thieves. This time the offenders, captured here on CCTV, smashed through the store's front door and destroyed the eatery's two ovens. Police believe it could have been the start of an apparent crime spree across Newcastle. I think it's despicable. You know, we work hard for our money. A coffee shop in Jesmond was also hit early this morning. Its staff say the bandits thrashed the store after efforts to break into the safe failed. 20 minutes after that, just before 5am, the Bogas in Georgetown was robbed. A sledgehammer through the front door, um, broke the cigarette cabinet, stole um, quite a large amount of cigarettes. A short time later, a stolen car was used to ram a Stockton chemist. Police apprehended three juveniles and two adults when they attempted to ditch the vehicle. Earlier this morning, um, police became aware of a number of people on Ash Island who were subsequently arrested after a little bit of a chase and a little bit of a swim for one of our officers. The proximity, time frame and use of sledgehammers suggest to police the crimes were linked. Madeline Bond, NBN News. People will now really, I guess, get to feel the real impact of these sanctuary zones. Even though they say they're only 20%, they're going to realise that they do enc encompass around 70 to 80% of the, of the habitat that we fish. It may be two weeks since his retirement, but many still admit that the loss of Andrew Johns is still sinking in. The club will officially say its goodbyes tomorrow night before the match against Brisbane, and that's what the players have to think about. He's been a great clubman. He's put a lot into, into, into myself and, and a lot of players, so um, as much as you know, we'd like to thank him, I think we've, we've, we've got the game to worry about first. Jared Mullen learnt all he could playing with Johns, and his football tuition will continue up against the game's current leading player in Darren Lockyer. Last year when we played him in the semi-final game, um, you know, learned a fair bit off him that that night. Um, you know, he's just composure and um, you know stuff like that, and you know his, his skill level is unbelievable. And his effort last night, along with that of his Brisbane club mates against New Zealand, could be enough to spark the Broncos after their terrible start to the season. The guys pull up sore, but you know after a win like that the other night, 
it, it can sort of give you a bit more confidence and you can be even more damaging. So um, we've got to be right on our toes. Captain Danny Bedeiris has trained well despite a chip bone in his finger. However, George Carmont is in doubt due to a hamstring strain with Adam McDougall, a chance of starting in the centres. Steam locomotives have been an obsession for thousands of Hunter Rail enthusiasts ever since the first one was brought to the region from England in 1911. Steamfest this year drew a crowd of around 80,000 locals and out-of-towners. Well, I'm, I'm a rail buff and the kids like trains and um, so we, we're from Foster and we thought we'd bring them down for the day. And it was hard to tell who was more excited, him or his six-year-old triplets. There's a certain character to the old locomotives and trains compared to the new, you know, the modern stuff, you know. They've got a certain appeal to them, all, all ages. Trackside, even little ones were looking for the best photo opportunity with the steam trains, even though in some cases their love for the commercialised version was nearly as big as they were. But the size of the engine didn't really seem to matter. My dad's got a model of trains. And the kids like playing with that, so it's something I grew up with and sort of, um, we don't live near a railway line where we live, so they don't get to see this all the time. Speed certainly did count this afternoon in the annual steam engine versus Tiger Moth race between Newcastle and East Maitland. In the end, it was the Tiger Moth that ran out of puff, the 38.30 finishing first. Christy Carter, NBN News. In terms of power boats, these machines really are monsters of the deep. A range of craft took control of Newcastle Harbour for round three of Australia's offshore series on a circuit that went several kilometres out of the heads before looping back in. The power of these boats clear to sea as they seem to spend almost as much time above the water as they do on it. Brothers Steve and Andrew Searle had reason to start with confidence the pair won the previous round and had line honours in mind again today. Out in front though, Maritimo took control after Simrad had set the early pace. But the latter soon had much more to worry about. A fire on the portside engine quickly spread, filling the cabin with smoke as their race became one of saving the million dollar boat. We like to save the boat, those boats, you know, they're our passion so we need to uh, save the boat, we don't worry too much about us and uh, it's the boss's boat so we want to get it right for him. And the boss, Bill Barry Cotter, got a good look back in the pits. He was awarded the race win aboard Maritimo but the fact he's got to fix this one didn't have anyone celebrating. Oh yeah, too early, um, we've done a lot of damage, yeah, yeah. It was the last goodbye for Andrew Johns from league fans in general. Tears were already flowing before the man himself choked up 
at the thought that this was it. Getting the chance to thank his teammates and friends from football, it was his family that John's reserved special attention for. Then it was the fans' chance to say their goodbyes. If the faces didn't say it, the signs certainly did, and there's no doubting he'll be missed. The lap of honour could have lasted a lifetime, but he got something else that will, a grandstand named in his honour. The rest have memories. If you can't do a grandstand for Andrew Johns, who can you do one for? You know, I think, I think a statue's in order as well. If they just get enough bronze around there for his backside. The NRL are also looking into ways to immortalise Andrew Johns, but there's certainly no replacing him in the hearts and minds of the Red and Blue Army. And with one last wave goodbye, the rest of his life now begins. Jim Callanan, NBN News. It played a big part in Australia's military history and Newcastle's past, but thanks to vandals and neglect, Fort Scratchley has been in constant demise in recent years. A new documentary made at the University of Newcastle details the evolution of the site and the case for its restoration. I really hope that the four million will be um, put to good work and used efficiently and quickly to have the site restored and reopened to the public. The documentary features an animation of the night the fort became the only Australian military post to fire on an enemy target. Newcastle Council would eventually like to see the guns firing regularly, but only to attract tourists. People go to Edinburgh Castle to hear and see the guns being fired at 1pm. We can do the same thing here. Once restored, Council will consult with the Fort's Historical Society to discuss ways to keep it viable. Future ventures such as function rooms or a cafe on the site could help to ensure the facility never falls into disrepair again. We need to generate enough income from the site to make sure the maintenance and repairs are catered for in the future. Restoration work starts next month and should be completed early next year. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. It was a grey old day at Broadmeadow, but there's no indication that Newcastle Basketball Stadium's financial future is clouded. At least, that's what the board says. Just in the last couple of months we've had our full audit completed and the auditors are more than happy with the progress of the place. But the board isn't happy with the current lease arrangement with the state government, which owns the site and currently owed $650,000 by the stadium for renovations made in 1986. Newcastle Basketball lost a farmer's market because of zoning restrictions. Now it wants to change its status through the lands department to ensure it keeps things like a fortnightly computer sale. Does the future of the facility depend on having these events here? Not necessarily because all we have to do then if we don't have these other events coming through, the price for participation rises. They've already done that, hiking playing fees from between 16 and 30 per cent and now comparable with places like Maitland. The stadium sources other income from its budget accommodation service with approval for 63 additional beds. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. For decades, these images captured on film have helped shape Australia's perception of the Anzac legend. It's uh, common on Anzac Day to run some footage of men leaping from boats and going ashore. It's often uh, presented as if it's documentary footage, but it's in fact mostly from The Hero of the Dardanelles, a movie made in 1915. It was that fact that prompted Avondale College lecturer David Renault to examine how the Anzac has been portrayed to audiences through films, his findings now published in a book called Celluloid Anzacs. The early Anzacs were portrayed as um, British, city people, upper class, good officer material and very, very loyal to the empire. And gradually over time that shifted to a, a country image, the Bushman, who's actually anti-British. Dr Renault now plans to explore the link between the Anzacs and religion. 
there's some terrific stories of the chaplains. And in fact, a couple of them were considered the most famous Anzacs of all by the end of the First World War. Christy Carter, NBN News. It's going to take more than magic water to get Daniel Abraham going again after his troublesome ankle flared up in last night's match and eventually forced him off late in the game. It just gradually got worse and to the stage where you know, I was a passenger out there and you know, the last thing I wanted to do was, you know, because I couldn't get around the park, you know, let a try in. It's the same ankle that's caused him all sorts of problems in the past, but he hasn't ruled out being ready to play the Sharks next week. A seven or eight day turnaround has been good for it and uh, you know, it might just be enough to get me on the park on Monday. Kangaroo forward Steve Simpson will certainly enjoy the extended layoff after playing two games in 48 hours. The clock also ticking on his team, which continues to be its own worst enemy. The way we're going at the moment, we just sort of keep doing the same things each week, so we just got to slowly get it into our minds that we're sort of shooting ourselves in the foot, so to speak. He's a certain starter for the coming Origin campaign, as is Danny Badiris, while Kurt Gidley continues to press his claims. Another standout performance overnight has many suggesting he's zeroing in on a Blues jumper. I'd much rather be playing consistent and, and winning. Um, you know, playing well and losing still isn't a great deal of fun. Jim Callanan, NBN News. There were a few announcements today that pleased all A-League clubs. Outside of a small increase to the salary cap, there was provision to increase squad size from 20 players to 23. As for the actual playing, the pre-season tournament kicks off in mid-July, while the season proper starts in late August, with Newcastle travelling to play Perth in the first round. The club's first home game is against Queensland on Sunday, September 2. In a move that also pleases the Jets, it doesn't face an extended period on the road, as they've suffered in previous years when Energy Australia's playing surface required running repairs, usually around October-November. Seven Newcastle and Hutter rugby players have won selection in the country team to play Darwin in the opening Australian Rugby Shield match on May 5. It's the same day that nine Group 21 Rugby League players will represent with Northern Division against the Central Coast in Game 1 of the CRL's Elimination Championship. It was good reward after the group's representative side won the Divisional Championship in Tamworth at the weekend. Meanwhile, National Ice Hockey League champions, the Newcastle North Stars, are one from two after a double-header weekend to open the season. It was along this stretch of road that the 25-year-old man was knocked down by a vehicle sometime between 9.30 and 10.20 last night. All indications are that the vehicle did not stop at all and we're seeking assistance from members of the public who may be able to identify that vehicle. Police say the man had been walking home from a friend's house in Tanilba Bay when he was hit. It's unsure how long the victim was left lying by the side of the road before nearby residents heard his cries for help and alerted authorities. He was then airlifted to John Hunter Hospital where he remains in a serious condition with a fractured spine, lacerations and loss of a little finger. Police are now looking for anyone who may have witnessed the incident. Any um, vehicle repairers that uh, become aware of a vehicle that uh, may have some suspicious damage, if they could also contact police. Madeline Bond, NBN News.
Two-year-old twins Braith and Seth make a curious pair, but on the 12th of March, a little boy's sense of adventure almost killed them. It's different having two than one, and um, they do everything the same, and for them to even this to happen to both of them is bizarre. The family was at Belinda's parents' house after learning her uncle had died. The kids were outside and left unsupervised for just a few moments, seconds even, before the twins got through the unlatched gate and into the pool. They were blue and lifeless, lifeless. and unconscious when we pulled them out of the water. And, um, but we, yeah. But yeah, but we just cleared their airways and, and started doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth on them. Mum and Dad's actions of pulling them out of the pool and giving them mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation um, definitely saved the child's life. Today, Belinda and Sean were recognised by the Ambulance Service for successfully performing EAR, or Expired Air Resuscitation. When we got them to the ambul ambulances, uh, they were both crying, and they reassured us that that was the best sound that we could hear. Belinda and Sean say the boys have made a full recovery and will be back in the water next summer, with Mum and Dad, of course. We're relieved and happy <laughs> that we've got our family still. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. While Dr Arne Sprogas's decision to stand down as the Chief Executive of the Hunter Urban Division of General Practice has come as a surprise to many, the man himself says he decided not to renew his contract three years ago. Because I actually believe there's a, uh, a use-by for uh, the CEO job and, uh, and I think 15 years is long enough. As for what he'll remember most about his time on the job? Um, obviously the after hours service, I mean it's not only Australia's best uh, but it actually is among the world's best and uh, delivering that for this community uh, has uh, without a doubt been a highlight. But while he may be moving on, he's certainly not giving up his long-term mission. It is disgraceful that regional areas do not get their fair share of Commonwealth funding. And uh, till the day I drop dead, uh, that'll be on my agenda. Madeline Bond, NBN News. He might not be a card shark, but Knights coach Brian Smith remains happy enough to play the hand he's been dealt. And his current game of patience continues after seeing relative improvement in his players, if not the end result. We're hanging in a bit longer even though we, we haven't really hit our straps but we feel like there's some bits in the jigsaw that are starting to come together. It was always going to be the case with a crop of younger players coming into the squad while the hole left by the former number seven doesn't help. You know, to replace a player uh, in the halfback position in any club immediately and expect everything to fire up would be uh, silly I think. Preferring to persist, the only real changes to the team named to play the Sharks are positional. However, there are three on standby due to injury concerns to Josh Perry, Dan Toller and Daniel Abraham. While the signs improved on the latter today, should the club need a new 5-8, it won't be Kurt Gidley. That's probably something we need to chew on a little bit longer. I'm not pretending there's an easy answer to that one. There's no need to guess how Corey Patterson feels about playing first grade with the teenager enjoying every minute. When you sit back and think about it, you just played like Darren Lockyer, the world's greatest player, and Petro, so you sort of, I, I tend to appreciate it where I am and what I'm doing a lot more when I, when I think about it. And it's on again Monday night. Jim Callinan, NBN News.
It's hard to believe this scenic delight was once sporting fields. But after 22 years of hard work and dedication, the Hunter Wetland Centre is paving the way for the region to tackle greenhouse gas emissions. I call it a jewel in Newcastle's crown. It's a lung for Newcastle. It provides uh, environmental uh, refuge for all the birds and animals around the Newcastle area. Thousands of trees have been planted at the centre. Wilma Barden, one of the countless volunteers who gave more than 23,000 hours to the cause last year, given the honour of planting the 50,000th tree on the site. We think it's a very important thing for the whole world to have this environmental development, but especially for Newcastle. Melissa Lyons, NBN News.